I'm breaking my own rule today on the Damcasters. We are going to be covering Market Garden. We're going to Arnhem with the fabulous Al Murray. Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. And like I said, we're breaking rules today on the Damcasters. We're going to do Market Garden. We're looking at Arnhem specifically on Tuesday, the 19th of September, because we have comedian and erstwhile historian, as he said he wanted to be called, Al Murray joining us with his new book, which is out now, Black Tuesday, which is all about that faithful Tuesday in the cauldron. And I'm going to be chatting many things. We're going to be mainly looking at 38 Group, but we're going to be asking questions about Market Garden as a whole, dig into some of the specifics that Al covers, because Tuesday is the pivotal day in the battle. It went on longer than that, but by this point, as he, Al focuses in, this is where the battle is won and lost. So we're going to be talking about Arnhem, we're going to be talking about 38 Group, Lummy Lord, Flack, all kinds of stuff, and even what he's got coming up next. But of course, before we cut over to that, we have to thank our incredible sponsors at the Pima Air and Space Museum for their continued support of the Damcasters. Honestly, it is a AV Geeks playground out there. So do head out if you can, if you're ever out in the Tucson area. But if not, be sure to check out all their social medias because they're doing some really fun stuff with Ramon from Boneyard Safari with some aerial shots of some of the aircraft. So be sure to head over to www.pimaair.org for more information. And of course, to our other partner, who is Tom over at 909 Apparel. Many congratulations on five years since his first sale. Check them out. Links in the description below. I wear this. The question I always want to ask is, how do you want to be introduced? You you go without introduction needed, of course. Al, but... Oh, com comedian and, and erstwhile historian or something like that. Okay. By me. Yeah. Cool. So, stuff, you know. super. All right, well, let, let's get cracking because I've... Yeah, yeah. This is a question I wanted to ask you specifically, yeah. yeah. which is the why Arnhem thing. This, this thing lives <laughs> rent free in our heads and yeah. Yeah. I'm breaking my rule for you to yes. not cover Market Garden on this show. Right. Great. So why Arnhem? Why does it have this almost Rourke's drifty sort of thing in all of our sort of military history geek heads? Well, I think I think you you know you've struck on it there. Um, it, 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 the film, mm -hmm. the movie, the movie. Uh, it's very interesting. Before um, uh, uh, the book, A Bridge Too Far, before the Cornelius Ryan book, Arnhem was regarded as sort of you know this kind of um, oh well, this happened and move on event in the sort of historiography. And if you read like a Ch Chester Wilmot Struggle for Europe book, for instance, it's it it merits it merits some mention, but but he doesn't get. He, he doesn't get sort of stuck into it. And it's interesting because the, because all of the things that have gone with it have since amplified, you know, it, 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 uh, it was regarded as a misstep by, by, uh, you know, Montgomery and, 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 and Ike, you know, um, mm. because after all he signed off on it. And now it's seen as Montgomery's greatest error that writes him off as a general completely, like everything about it has become amplified and, and turned up to 11. And I think, I really do think the movie has a lot to do with it. And I think that A Bridge Too Far, because it's, because it's, um, it leans hard into lots of sort of archetypes culturally um, uh, uh, um, and really milks them for everything they're worth. It just, it's turned it into this battle in people's heads. I mean, I was, we were there last week, James and I went to um, Arnhem itself and Nijmegen to, to, to do our walking the ground thing. And, the the sort of there's a sense of ownership about the battle that you wouldn't that you don't get if you go to Montormel or if you go mm -hmm. to the Epsom battlefield you know all these other mother you know in fact in Normandy other much bigger much more prolonged much more decisive actions actually it's it there's just something about it that is that is a rock's drift thing it is it's got last stand and it it's got you know even the maroon berets are kind of like a red coat echo Mm -hmm. in, a, in in their own way that you that, that that make the film pop and in the movie for instance the, the cinematography really leans into the sort of khakis and colors and yellows of the denison smocks and all that sort of thing so i think it's largely the motion the movie that's responsible for this but then the story itself is freighted with what ifs 
uh, uh, more or less according to taste. You know, plenty of people say it's harebrained doom from the outset, and other people think it's much more in the balance as it goes. Um, but it's it's the it's the yeah last stand, Rourke's drift, the motion picture, and the and the fact that it's chock with what ifs. Apparently, mm. I think that would All be right. the answer. <laughs> so re really, it's the you know we can accept your surrender scene, which is the best bit. Yes, the, which is made up, completely yeah. made up, and and not 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 one bit true. And uh, and that's sort of part of the sort of. Um, you know, the, part of the fun of peeling the onion uh, um, of the movie, even before you get into the, the events at Arnhem itself. So I have to admit, when I first heard about this book, I was quite yeah. surprised because I was always expecting some point in your future, the two volume end to end Al Murray <laughs> take on Market Garden. So why, why Black Tuesday? Why just this 24 hours, this quite focused look at the... the well, because, the because, I mean... Because, um, you know, and I, I mentioned this in the in the introduction to the book. I remember when my dad retired. And my, it's, I'm, in, I'm really interested in this. I'm interested in this primarily because my father, because he knew people who were there and all this stuff. And he was an airborne engineer. And, and you know, there were maroon berets in my life when I was a small boy and all this stuff. And all his mates were TA people and all this sort of thing. And um, I said to him after he retired, why don't you write a book about the Battle of Arnhem? He said, there's nothing new to be said. There's no point. Just... Why, why would I bother? And great, great, you know, greater men than I have gone before me and all this sort of thing. Right. And which is, after all, the, the one of the issues with writing about this battle is greater men than I have gone before me writing about this. But I wanted to write about it. But I also wanted to sort of not have to do the same story because the, mm. the, there is an issue with the, you know, from, purely from a narrative, keeping the interest sustained point of view. There is a problem with the shape of the battle, which is the Tuesday really is the kind of the climax of the battles or the airborne division's ability to do anything offensive. It's the high watermark of the, 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 their assets in Arnhem. Or the, obviously the polls arrived later and are delayed, but the, the Tuesday midnight on Tuesdays, they've got, they got the most people in town and they got a fresh brigade. And, you know, you, it's kind of like a moment still with some possibility in it. I think what, you know, what those outcomes would have been, I don't know, but anyway, and I thought, well, the, and the, so the days after it, the siege, it, even in the best accounts of the Battle of Honor, those chapters sort of wane. They go from everything on the Wednesday, and then the, if you even the Martin Middlebrook, which is sort of regarded as one of the great the great accounts, the the, the the chapter for the Friday is quite short because they get mortared in the morning. The Germans probe, you know, on the that morning it's the KOSB's turn, and then it's the Border's turn, and then the and then come nightfall they get mortared again when they stand to to dusk and. And it's another uncomfortable night. And, the, and the, the shape of the story until the sort of medical truce and then the evacuation at the end of the siege, it's kind of the same. It's hard to, you know, I wanted to write something mm. different. I wanted to write something interesting. I wanted to write something that wasn't like the other books. And it just occurred to me that the one, this one day, and it's, you've try, and, you know, try as I might, I wasn't actually allowed to start at midnight, like from a sort of like a cold start in a sitcom, you know, it, you know <laughs> wasn't allowed to do that. But I, I and also what I really wanted to do, because this, you know, as I said earlier, this battle's regarded by lots of people as fated and doomed. They didn't think so. The men in First Airborne Division did not think this, you know, even on the last thing on the Tuesday night, the bridge, they're still thinking, well, maybe Second Army will relieve us tomorrow and we'll be pulled out of this mess. They were still thinking that P plenty of them did, didn't think that would happen. But, but I wanted it to feel like what happens next, what is going to happen next, because they don't know. And I wanted to put that back in. And the only way to do that was to pick, I think, the most dramatic day of the battle and end at the end of it. And, you know, me and my editor had a sort of a, a very sort of pleasant arm wrestle about this, where he's going, you can't end the book with what would happen tomorrow. We just can't do that. You're going to have to put a postscript. And I get I relented in the end. Um, but that was the idea to, 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 to try and make it like what is going to happen tomorrow without without foreshadowing, without all the things that trying to remove those things so that actually you can look at their decisions far more in the context of the present moment that they were made in than in the context of 80 years later and the, and the wisdom of being able to know everything about it. So, so what challenges does looking at just 24 hours without trying to do the what happens next bit? Yeah. Because I, I did notice you did tend to go backwards a lot more than you yeah. sort of looked forward. You, you had a lot of, yes. when you would introduce someone, there would be a couple of paragraphs on, on their history. Did you feel that that was 
bending your own rules of just looking at no. 24 hours? No, I think who you are on the Tuesday, especially in a, you know, I mean, the, 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 like all of these things, the, 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 you know, they're brand new, the Airborne, they've been invented. It's not like they're the Warwicks or something and they've got the, you know, and they're a sort of mm. standard issue kind of uh, regiment or whatever. They've been, they're brand new. It's all been devised. It's all been, it's changing like mad and relentlessly. And I think you do have to sort of backstory people a bit, but I didn't, but, 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 but without trying to not put foreshadowing in. So there is, a, you know, there's a whole chapter about Urquhart's career because in a normal nine day Arnhem book, Urquhart would get, you, you might get heart, you might get a paragraph on who he is, what he's done before, 231 Brigade, Malta, his time in the desert, his time in uh, 51st Highland Division, his understanding of what command is and all that. Because I think he's often portrayed as this sort of hapless sap who run, who goes running forward, you know, leaves his headquarters sort of entirely recklessly. And I, I argue he's doing it, in, it's in character. It's completely in character. It's how he's done things up till now. The fact is, the circumstances are sort of wildly different to the situations he's done that in before, but that's not necessarily, you know, it makes him the, it makes him the victim of contingency, but also character, which is after all what we all are. And I'm not, I'm not a long durée person. I'm not a like tectonic plates of history person. I think contingency is incredibly important and character is incredibly important to how things turn out. And in Urquhart's case, that's definitely the case. And that's why you need to know who he is and you need to know how he got the job and how much it pissed people off that he got the job and how that means he can't really control his brigadiers and all that stuff. You need to know about that, which is why him being absent from the headquarters impacts in so many extra ways. And, the, and at the time, they did think he was dead so you or missing or wounded or whatever. So you want it to, you want it, you, he carries his baggage around with him but I didn't want the battle's baggage to be how I wrote the book. So that was the, that was the, I, I, I know exactly what you mean. Also, the, the, there's been some brilliant history by Seb Ritchie, the RAF historian, yeah. about, about the air component of the Market Garden. Absolutely brilliant stuff that has cut like a knife through so much of the standard historiography. And I lean quite heavily on a lot of what he says, right, for this book. It absolutely slices through a load of it. And, and that meant that, and he says, you can't think of Market Garden on its own. You've got to think of it in terms of, of Normandy, but really you've got to think of it in terms of Sicily, of the landings of Sicily and the disasters of Husky and how what they're desperate to avoid is a repeat of some of that stuff. And 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 if Urquhart's come in from outside and as they call him a landlubber, all the airborne people are saying to him, look, we don't want another lift like that. We want to all land together. So everything's under control the minute we land and then we can then we can proceed to what we're what our mission is right mm. and seb's really seb's very very persuasive about that that, that that the thing they're all desperate to do is avoid a repeat of sicily so you've got to know about the disasters in sicily you've got to know about what happened in normandy and those contexts of other airborne operations because because they don't it doesn't stand alone as an event on them at all um and often it's presented often it's presented as though it does you know it's like this sort of sort of, you know, anomaly rather than a play, something in a continuum. 100%. And I think you you bring that across well. And I, I suppose it's the one that sort of bookended between the big test that doesn't go right in Sicily, as you said, Normandy, which went wrong for yeah. many reasons, mainly a massive fog bank that appears out of yeah. nowhere. Yeah. And the one that actually goes quite well in March with Plunder Varsity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, yeah. So you have this sort of progression of lessons learned going through to just doing this massive one lift yeah. to get across the Rhine a, a bit yeah. later. So here's the question: As this is an aviation podcast, we're really yes, talking about airplanes. But yeah, yeah, the three A's that the Allies have: that artillery, armor, and air power, kind of doesn't come into effect here, yes. really. And me being attack air sort of guy, yeah. My question to you as the Arnhem guy, why is 83 Group not helping out more over Arnhem? So there's the, the worry about the flak on the bridge, yep. the surprise, all those things. Well within range for typhoons. Spitfires yep. from Belgium probably couldn't get there. Yeah. Why do they not have any tactical support above them? Because you'd um, think well, that would be great. Well, you'd think that would be you'd think that would be in place. And you'd think that would be in place if you don't really know how TAC Air works or has been working for the Allies up to this point, I think. Um, 
a big, you know, if you're because they all complain about it, all the all the paras complain about it, and the air air landing officers go, where where's the RAF? Where where are they? What's going on? Well, what, one thing that's quite telling is it's not until the 16th of September, the day before Market Garden, that Mary Cunningham comes in to talk talk to um, 21st Army Group about what they got planned. So it's all left quite late. You do have a massive tack air effort on the first day, suppressing flak. Great big one. And that's easy to, you know, relatively easy to organise and plan. You, you you mark out the targets, you know, what you, but it's the loitering air power that people um, feel they're not being given at Arnhem. And the reason for this is, you know, when you look at you look at the Normandy battlefield, even towards the end of the even towards the end of the break, you know, the breakout, the Falaise Gap battle, it's really not very far from the airfields to the battlefront at all. So aircraft, regardless of their range capability, can loiter, can can be present and and you know, and you've got you've got sufficient radio and all this sort of stuff to call in your typhoons and, and whatever. And this is non-existent at Arnhem because because the distance is it is 90 miles rather than, I don't know, 15 from uh, from where where um, the tactical air is based. And also, I think we also need to remind ourselves that, that all those tack air techniques and sort of familiarities and things. Are, are, are developed during the Normandy battle. They don't arrive with it completely working, c- completely functional, and it, and and it, you know, uh, and it standing up on all four legs. And First Airborne Division are not part of Twenty First Air uh, Army Group setup, so they're not they're not practiced um, uh, TAC Air clients for a start. Right? It's not their it's not their thing. Right? And. A big so there's so there is an American tack air group sent with them, um, a uh, radio tack air group in in Waco gliders, who and and they they bring they do bring the wrong crystals with them to Arnhem. So you know, famously in the movie, we've brought the wrong crystals, sir, for the the internal divisional net and and the artillery net and everyone's nets. Um, that's not right. It's the Americans who bring the wrong wrong with the, wrong stuff with them, and when they land, a bunch of them are killed. And uh, uh, and so the, there's an immediately the severance of the possibility of a radio link. I mean, what is interesting is after after Market Garden, sort of in in I think February of forty five, there's a thing called Exercise Bomb, which is by Six Airborne, where they basically they work through their entire comms nets and their and what they're going to what they're going to need to do for any potential crossing of the Rhine, and they run a great big great big staff exercise to make sure they've got everything radio wise in problem. So the lesson is learned that you know the stuff taken to Arnhem's imperfect, but it's a, it's to do with it's to do with, like all of these things in Market Garden, what it is, is, is it's, you know, it's a combination of factors that stuck, that, that if they all present themselves all at once, you're buggered, you're jiggered. And that it's, it's the distance, it's, you know, because TAC Air does start to, start to show up once Second Army are south of Arnhem. You do get TAC Air strikes in Arnhem on German vehicle columns. There's also a bomb line in place. Um, uh, uh, that's based on where they where the uh, people are expected to be if the plan goes according to plan, and they don't alter the bomb line. So there's all these, all these things that stack up that turn it into that there isn't the tack air that they ought to, that, that that they might expect. And also, you know, there is a genuine difficulty if you're fighting in streets, you know, um, and and all of the all of the fighting, the fibula fighting in Arnhem is extremely close quarters. You know that you strike a you strike an AFB and you probably you probably take out a load of Tommies as well. It, it is is the problem. So there's there's all these sort of all these things like sort of lasagna of issues that make for a that make make it not work. I think I think I think that that's that's my reading of it really. And you know the the other issue is that you know the the Normandy battle space has been curated for months before um uh uh, uh the invasion. You know with with medium with medium strike bomber strikes on um. Railway and all, railways and and you know, strategic air force strategic strikes on stuff, and Arnhem has not been similarly curated by 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 air forces because this is this plan has been thrown together in a, in ten days in a fortnight. So what you haven't got is all the all the entry points for German armor and all this sort of stuff um, uh, to get to Arnhem. That's not all been. It's not been strangled by air power. Arnhem as an environment, which is the other issue for for the people on the ground is that German armor can get there relatively easy rather, rather than like in Normandy where it's written down as it proceeds to the Normandy battlefront. So this, it, 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 you, you know, a lot of these things, the problems of the success of the breakout from Normandy 
You know, the breakout of anomaly is a great success. And they're trying to exploit that success, but they can't bring to bear the things that brought about that success. Yeah. And there's does that make sense? It, it, it sense. does. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, having gone through the, the numbers, there is a spike just funnily enough after the battle where there's quite yeah. a few losses when they do start going after yeah. the routes leading up to the bridge and things. Yeah. Um, Cheval Lallemont famously gets shot down at Arnhem and quite badly yeah. burnt. Yeah. Um, after the after the events of this particular battle, which is all a little yeah. bit strange, but there we go. I've worked typhoons in. Everybody can drink, and <laughs> now we can get. Well, they're all. Go I mean, they're, you, they're all going. Where's the fucking RAF? They're all saying that. Where's our tactical air? We, you know, we because they've all been. The thing about First Airborne Division, they have been on standby since the invasion. In fact, before the invasion, in fact, they all think they're going. They think they're going to do. Um, you know, what what they then discover is Overlord. They read about it in the papers and they're all terribly upset. And and they they must think part of the sort of suite of things at their disposal. If you're a private, part of the, you, you assume part of the suite of things at your disposal is this endless air cover that will that will rescue you, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's absolute. Yeah. It, it it it's fascinating. And and a lot of that sort of research into um, you know, like Goodison people like that looking at how air power shifts as it sort of heads out of the breakout. Yeah. That sort of the pause, the sort of 45 minute call time, something yeah. big happens. You have the, the advance through that might not have caused much damage, but your boys are suddenly a lot more G'd up for it yeah. because there's just been an airstrike. Yeah. All fascinating stuff. But I'm <laughs> very keen to talk about 38 group because yeah. they get very little coverage. I've done numerous shows with Adam Berry about the ninth troop carrier command and yeah. the insane war that they had. Yeah, these guys had very, very similar thing and get other than probably now when we're talking about Arnhem, much less of the press because yeah, yeah. they've been doing it since Africa as well, haven't they? Yes, I mean they're, they're, they're you know they're they're basically, I mean this is the, this is the other thing that, that that um so much of the Arnhem history is so army heavy, and in fact that that you know this is a a, a truly a, a true coexistence thirty eight group with with airborne forces that that they are. They're completely tangled up in one another and their fates are intertwined in every way possible. And it, 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 I always think it is, you know, it is strange that you don't read more of more of what 38 group, you know, because as you say, they, you know, they they have done, they've done North Africa, they've done Sicily, they've done Normandy. They're there they're, because you, you can't have one without the other. And in fact, you what you really can't have is airborne forces without 38 group. I mean, it's it, the, the <laughs> they are the, the, the horse and the cart, you know, the, 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 there's. And that's always, after all, the been that's been the ongoing problem for for the airborne end, the the army end of things is that you know this whole complaint about the air ministry not taking it seriously, not giving them aircraft, not giving them air crew, and all that. And yet, given how airbrained a lot of what the airborne are, are, are planning, I I wouldn't give them planes either. You know, like <laughs> thanks very much. You know, why would I waste good air crew on on, on this sort of thing? And 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 you know, they, I but I think particularly. You know, they have a, I mean, the, the, the thing that really, the, the thing that, you know, I've really tried to put into the book is they are inventing all of this. So even, even when Sicily goes wrong, there's still, it's an experiment. It's a great big bloody experiment, Sicily. And, and so, so it comes freighted with so much risk that then all, that then all comes home to roost. I mean, I'm mixing my metaphors wildly here, but, but they, you know, when you read um, uh, Lawrence Wright's book, um, uh, wooden sword and 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 Wright was some um, in a 38 group um, gliding person you know he was, he was tied up in the glider establishment so dealing dealing directly with the glider pilot regiment dealing directly with people like George Chatterton and uh, uh, and and he was a he was a um, uh, Ivinghoe glider club guy because they basically once the Germans use gliders at Ebon Mar they're like who knows how to who knows about gliders mm -hmm. so they go to Ivinghoe gliding club and get those people together and and Wright Wright is in 38 group and his job is evaluating landing zones for 38 group that is his that's his gig and he features in the book and really because because the whole landing zone story is lumped on the RAF and lumped on so therefore on 38 um, group whereas in fact it's that is just not the case that the it is not that you know the a bridge too far the calumny in that when the RAF officer says well the landing zones are here and points off the map that's not what that is not what happened. You know, the, 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 the army and the air force on this, the RAF 
and the army and, and, and so and by therefore 38 group are completely working together on the decisions of where to land you know the possibilities and what the army want from landing which is the, after all the important the actually the important question and it's not that the it's not that the air plan overlooks the army's requirements on this occasion that's just not that's not the case and 38 group you know Aside from the fact, you know, they're working around the clock to keep supply going because the allied supply lines are so stretched. The fact that they're able to consider all these operate this high turnover of aborted air, air operations as well, airborne operations, that they're planning people and working on this all the time and also running. I mean, I, you know, the sort of transport command end of things, it's always, oh, the pilots aren't as good and all this sort of thing. And it's not, it's not, what? What are you talking about? These are brilliant. These are brilliant people who know their aircraft fantastically. And and also when required, as we find out on the Tuesday afternoon, if they're told to fl fly at, I don't know, 400 feet and chuck stuff out the door into a, into into columns of flak, they'll do it. And they're and they and they won't shirk it, which is, you know, part of the grand tragedy of the, of the, the way the afternoon unfolds on, on the 19th of September, 1944. We're going to take a quick break to pop to the Pima Air and Space Museum and find out about one of the aircraft in the incredible Pima collection. Hey, good day. So today uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about one of our very special aircraft in the collection here at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, my name's Scott. I'm the executive director of the museum. And today's subject that we're talking about is our Douglas VC-118A Liftmaster. Uh, this airplane behind us is one of a hundred or so Douglas DC-6 uh, airframe types that the U.S. Air Force owned and operated uh, from the into World War II and well into the 50s. Uh, what distinguishes this airplane from its civilian counterpart was the uh, the installation of a large cargo door on the aft side of the aircraft. Now this airplane itself doesn't have that cargo door anymore because it was converted into a special missions fleet aircraft. So uh, this was part of the basically the executive VIP fleet that has now become known as the the presidential fleet in operation by the U.S. Air Force. This particular airplane uh, is serial number 53340 and uh, it came into service with the U.S. Air Force in the, in the early 1950s and uh, was part of the VIP fleet. What distinguishes this airplane from many others like it is this was actually a bona fide Air Force One. Um, during the administrations of President Johnson and Kennedy, uh, this airplane was used quite extensively, principally by President Johnson, but occasionally by President Kennedy. Um, both of the, the presidents preferred the larger 707 airframes that we're all familiar with, um, but at the time, a lot of airfields weren't prepared or able to handle the larger jet aircraft, so this airplane was used for going into smaller, smaller airfields, shorter durations. Um, the, you know, President Kennedy used it to go up to, uh, to the family compound uh, uh, regularly from Washington, D.C. Um, but President Johnson used it quite extensively, so much so that um, uh, being a bit of a control freak and kind of a fusser, uh, he insisted on having a set of basic flight instruments installed in the presidential cabin so he could monitor what the pilot was doing and he would occasionally call up and uh, <laughs> give some advice to the pilot on how he wanted him to trim and fly the airplane and watch the RPM. So. Um, so the airplane itself uh, was ultimately replaced by the, the larger jet fleets and retired across the street to uh, Amark in uh, 1975. And in 1978, it came over here as, as part of the permanent collection of the Pima and Space Museum. Um, it is one of the, I think only one of the only actual presidential Air Force Ones that's outside of Dayton or the Presidential Library Network. So we're, we're very fortunate to, to have that here in our collection, along with several other VIP fleet airframes. To find out what's going on at the Pima Air and Space Museum and to see the incredible collection that they have, please visit www.pimaair.org for more information and be sure to give them a follow via all the links in the description to this episode. And now back to the show. And that's the thing that I think to the casual viewer, yeah, they think that these guys have done Normandy, yeah, put their feet up, yeah, had a brew, yeah. waited waited for Market Garden, and then done the same for Plunder Varsity, yeah. 
but they've been constant. They've been doing multiple lifts. They've been doing the air evacuation. They've been doing yeah. resupply. And you know, they're being worked to the bone. And like you said, yeah. there's God knows how many cancelled ops. It's 16. The, the, it's 16. It and 16? I'm not, yeah. yeah, I'm not sure, uh, you know, and they're all planned to varying degrees. So, but what this leads to in, with the market plan is, is you know, on because there's a previous operation called Comet, which is the, mm -hmm. the week before that gets cancelled. And, and it gets be beefed up to Market Garden um, because of intelligence about the presence of uh, two SS Panzer Corps. So the so the again the the the, the army's version of event you know the, the mythical version of events that that you know no one knew and they were concealing the truth it's just yeah. not it's just not the case right so it's sixteen ops and they're all planned to varying degrees but the orders for Market Garden lots of them say see Comet orders same as Comet or Comet orders Air Plan as Linit which is another one Air Plan you know because they're they're piling these operations up so so fast. That they they go well, you know. There's no point typing those orders up again. We're gonna we're gonna cannibalize a bit of that plan, cannibalize a bit of that plan, stick them together, and that you know, and that's again where where you start to get this sort of multiplication of contradictions and errors because they haven't got time to comb through and, and come up with a complete plan. So the air plan is a cannibalized version, and they're overwhelmed by the planning. And Lawrence Wright talks about being overwhelmed, overwhelmed by the planning. Um, you know, they're loading, the men are loading gliders and then unloading them because you can't leave the gliders loaded because, because you know, they're made of plywood and they might break, you know, if you over, <laughs> if you keep doing that, you know, they're kind of, because they are after all like a one shot thing, really, the gliders. So, so the, the, the sort of relentless churn in the orders. So the staff are being worked to the bone with this, with this as well, as well as the air crews, like keeping the, keeping the whole thing moving. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. The sort of perception is they... They fly three times a year and, you know, um, and, and it's all a bit easy and they're not the best pilots. And in fact, they're, you know, they're, as in they're working as intensely as anyone else in the RAF. So we've moved on from the best troops dropped by the worst air crews thing then. Absolutely. Absolutely. Super. And you, you've also moved on from that because, because everyone's just got far more experience than they had. You know, the mm. first, the, you know, North Africa... Um, J uh, James Hill, who's the uh, uh, commanding officer for one first parachute battalion at the time, he chooses his drop zones from the door of the Dakota. <laughs> They've got such bad intel, and he's at the door going, "Yeah, uh, uh, you know, a couple more miles, wow. and then we'll uh, that field over there now, <laughs> right?" And so to have the air op, to have the air operation, the air side, the air plan work so perfectly on the first day of Market Garden for, for everyone for for hundred first, eight second. And for the first airborne division, it just go it goes completely according to plan. And Seb Ritchie, of course, would argue that that they achieve as much as they do the um, uh, airborne uh, division um, in on them because the air plan goes as well as it does, and not the other way well, around. The, well, the official historian of the RAF probably would, wouldn't? Yes, he would. But, but I think, <laughs> but, I, but no, but but you, when you when you then look at what they it, decide, if you're listening, Seb, big fan. I that is oh no, I'm passing joke. But, <laughs> but if you then look at what the what the army decide to do, having been airlifted in, you know, to the point where everyone thinks it's an exercise, right? What the army then decide to do is the is the issue, not where they've been landed. It's the yeah. fact that they then, they then dither and uh, d don't concentrate their force and f piss fart about. It's the it's the honest <laughs> sort of the, the, the rough the rough analysis <laughs> that I think your listeners can uh, withstand. But I mean, it, you know, it, yeah, we have moved completely on from. Poorly trained pilots um, uh, dropping the best soldiers. It, 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 that doesn't that does not stack up. So what was supposed to happen with the second lift? I, I think that that if we do, if we try to explain that, it explains what actually did happen a little bit clearer, doesn't it? Well, the second lift's meant to come on the on the on the. You know, they land they land the first lift, go in, bang on time. You know, the first pathfinders jump from their Sterlings at twelve forty on the Sunday. And it's 186 guys from 21st Independent Parachute Company, and they and they're dropped all over the landing zones, um, and, and mark them out, put the beakers in, and literally mark the the, the the LZs and DZs, you know, with a big X for DZX, the big, you know, they do all that, right? And then within the next hour, everyone else arrives, and it's an extraordinary feat of um of flying by everybody involved, the, the the tugs, the glider pilots, everything. The second lift is meant to come the following morning and it doesn't. It gets delayed by bad weather and, and arrives at um, sort of two o'clock. And that delay um, is very interesting in, in the knock-on effect it has on the battle because what you've got is a whole fresh um, parachute brigade in town. Now, 
because it's not the first day and there is no surprise anymore. And, you know, the, 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 the airborne operation surprised you probably get three hours out of that before the enemy figure out what you're mm-hmm. about, you know, um, the, uh, uh, or until nightfall, perhaps of the same day. Um, and, and obviously they're not they're not dropping at night because um, all the night drops with uh, the night drops with Sicily and Normandy are to do with the fact that the army want to land at dawn on on beaches. That's the army doctrine is you arrive at, you know, or just before first light on a beach. So you get the most out of the day but, uh, and so on with it and get the tides. And, all. and that's why you that's why you've been parachuting at night. That is no longer a requirement. And everyone is hugely relieved that they can do this thing by day. So the first lift comes on the Sunday. The second lift is delayed. And what's quite interesting is at the time when the second lift is meant to come in the morning, the Germans actually send troops to the drop zone. And there's a there's a fight on the drop zone at the at the very moment when the the second lift should be arriving, which suggests that someone's been interrogated or whatever, or the you know mm. the Germans are figuring it out. Anyway, the, the second lift arrives and then you've got a whole parachute brigade. So suddenly there's another two and a half thousand paratroopers and they're all keen as mustard to fight that that you can be assured of in the it, from from all the accounts. They are they are very in quality, these battalions, but they are very, 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 very keen to kill Germans. Basically, it's the, it's the long, the short mm. of it. And that lift being late delays what can be done with them. So it's decided to basically do something with them the following morning. So first light the following morning, you know. So immediately, rather than them arriving 24 hours later, they're kind of, or or within 24 hours, they're arriving a full 24 hours later, and they're not going to go into battle until, you know, 36 hours after the landings have started, which means the Germans have had plenty of time to figure out that the great big bridge on the Nader Rhine might be the thing that the British are trying to seize. Hmm. And so the second lift goes wrong, really, because... The weather delay, but the second lift, the second lift is in itself the problem. The second lift that you are doing a second lift has paralyzed what first airborne division are going to do on the ground because they have to leave half their strength behind to hold the landing zones. And so, yes, the second lift is delayed. Yes, it goes wrong. Yes, it, it multiplies a set of then creates a set of decisions that have to be made. But they just should never have, should never have been trying to do that in the first place. It's just, it's, it's daft. It, it it's really wrong headed because it divides your Force, you know, you 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 land six thousand men, two and a half thousand go to the bridge. The rest stay behind. It's 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 kind of bonkers, really. And the Americans have a similar problem that they have a second lift coming in at Nijmegen, the eighty second airborne. They have to defend DZT, hmm. um, uh, which is the one that backs down onto the Reichsfeld. So it's Germany ne- next stop Germany, and so they guard that rather than take the Nijmegen bridge, which is kind of like, you know, real cart before the horse stuff. Uh, as it were but yeah the second lift is the the second lift is the thing that at midnight on the tuesday they've got to decide what to do with the second what to do with those soldiers what are we going to use them for and that's sort of what the book's about what opposition did they face going in on 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 the lift that you cover in your book because there's the famous 190 crashing into the church yeah which has i think is is a rule that has to get mentioned in oh, yeah, every yeah, yeah, yeah. every book yeah. about arnhem that's like the law but what what are they facing coming in? Because it's not as not as easy as the first one. They're expected. Yeah. Things start getting a bit hairy, don't they? Yeah, things get hairy. I mean, on, on the second lift, they take a different route. So they come, they they take the southern route and they come up kind of up the corridor with a view that that's going to give them more. Because they, they, they know the second lift is going to be, you know, the Germans are going to probably try and run more interference on it. But but what's interesting is on the on the Monday morning. The men on the men of the border regiment who are defending um, one of the landing zones are strafed by um, mesh smiths that the, and all the they all run out and they, the lads all run out to wave at these planes because they think they're spitfires. And then they're strafed and several men of the border regiment are killed because the RAF, the RAF are not running air superiority um, ops over over Arnhem. That, that, so that so they do run into they do run into more opposition and the, and the Luftwaffe starts to show up and you get. I mean, it's interesting because all the accounts all talk about being strafed by fog wolves, and I, it's it's the same ones, but 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 everyone remarks on it, and everyone thinks, oh, that's that's not the that's not the what was in the man, you know, in the game plan as as we understood it. So there is but those those guys are all supposed to be dead by now. Yes, and they're all supposed to be dead by now. And and also, I mean, the other thing is the second lift, for or for the third lift on the on the on the on the Tuesday, the um. 
the timings all change and the fighter escort isn't told. So the fighter escort goes to its, its couple of hundred Spitfires and Mustangs, goes to the rendezvous, waits for the Dakotas and Sterlings. They don't show up. So they piss off. And, you know, you've got this thing where the RAF isn't talking to itself in that regard, but I, I can completely understand why, because these things are so complex and enormous and, and also hanging on lots of different contingencies. So you can see why that might happen. But that's, again, that's where you start to get this sort of compounding error problem in, in, in the conduct of the battle. Yeah. It, it's that, that third, you describe it quite frantically. Yeah. In, in the book, because a lot happens in a very quick amount yeah. of time. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure saying we don't want to spoil it, go buy the book goes without saying, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure if you're listening to this, you, you probably know you what know. happens, but you know, yeah, yeah. I'm, <laughs> I've always been sort of fascinated by David Lord and yeah. Yeah. There's fire scares me out. Yeah. You know, I'm fair enough. I've spent my, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've read my whole life reading about Second World War aviation and yeah. people getting burnt up. That's yeah. that he managed. Well, what what did David Lord, what Lummy Lord do? Well, I'm not going to. Well, he comes. In, I'm going to get you well, to waffle well, on about come it. Well, they come in. They come in. You know, at three o'clock. Here they here comes the supply drop, and the the problem is, is the supply drop zone is in enemy hands. Um, Urquhart claims that in the morning he he tried to get the get it redirected but we we don't we don't you know he there's a there's a crumb of doubt about whether he whether whether that's actually the case or not anyway that that and in it in they come at, at you know 400 to 600 feet something like that everyone flying very close to their stall speed um you know and they're and they're chucking stuff out of sterlings and out of dakotas and in the in the in the in the dakota there's like a roller system you know, and they, um, uh, and they have to push the supplies up the tracks when it's parked in through the back door. And, uh, and, and in the Sterling things are being stuff's being tossed out of the bomb bay by the, by the crew. So you have the RAF crew and then you have the RAC, RASC guys. And what's quite interesting is that the, so Lord comes in, he, he, his wings on, his wings hit, he turns around and he comes back again um, to, to complete his supply run. And then the plane crashes on the, on the, uh, on the landing zone ne next to the um, uh, Rikers Camp farm, which is, um, uh, and there's a memorial there now, which is one of the landing zones. And and everyone sees this happen. And I think the, 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 the interesting thing about the supply drop run is it's a moment that's simultaneously actually a disaster and also symbolic of disaster because everyone sees this thing play out. Everyone sees Lord. Everyone remembers Lord. Jeffrey Powell is the one of the company commanders says to turn, says to the bloke next to him, that bugger just got a VC mm. as he sees him go down in flames. What's quite interesting though, if you're the, if you're the families of the RASC crew, right. Mm. <laughs> in Lord's plane. And there's, there's a really great book about, about the RASC people at Arnhem and also about the RASC people with 38 group. Um, they point out that, um, well, the flight crews are all volunteers are uh, the RASC guys, they're not. Mm. And so it's all very well, Lord getting his Victoria Cross for, for taking his plane round and stick, staying at the controls and telling the crew to bail out and all this sort of thing. But but they all got killed and they don't get a medal. Mm. And there's a, because it, it, it's the most extraordinary story and like the, 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 the courage and bravery and he becomes sort of symbolic of that because there's loads of, uh, plenty of other aircraft are shot down, Sterling's shot, there's the Sterling with the, there's the Sterling with the bloke from the fleet air arm who's come along for a joyride, mm. you know, um, hooker. There's all those, there's all, all these stories of, of, of aircraft being smashed up and shot down. And all the, all the 38 group logs, you know, come all the, most of the planes have been damaged one way or another. They lose, they lose, you know, um, crews and air, aircraft, but yes, the Lord, Lord, it's, it's, it's the most, it, 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 it completely, um, you know, they need those supplies more than anything else. First Airborne Division at that minute, and they don't get them. And that someone should give his life to make sure that they try to get them, even though they, you know, it's the, it's the sort of, it's the uh, smorgasbord of failure of Arnhem. Like it's sort mm. of one of its richest meats, uh, Lord's death, unfortunately. I mean, you, you know, and he'd been, he'd been, he'd done the previous two runs, I think. So, you know, he, he'd been going to Arnhem backs and forwards. Because like you say, as, as you said earlier, these crews are working working really, really hard 
Yeah. And, and they're bringing in, I think you mentioned in the book, it, the plan was for that lift of 388 tons yeah. of, of stuff. So it, it's not, we're talking a lot. The berets are a weird note, which, you know, when they start popping these things up and finding loads of berets ready for the, yeah. the victory bits, which you think may be a later lift chaps for, for those. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I mean, that's, that's interesting because that's really part of the, um, you know, the sort of chaos of planning is that is they've just like, they've taken an inventory from a previous op and just sort of run it, run it onto the next one without really looking at it and thinking maybe, maybe bullets would be a better um, option. Mm. And they send 90 sets of pajamas as well for the, for the medical people, you know, do we really need 90 sets of pajamas when we could for the same weight, send more peat bombs or more, you know, cause, cause with this, obviously everything's an opportunity cost. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, and you know, the, the 17 pounder guns that they take, you know, it's these vast anti-tank weapons that can only be taken in the in the Hamel car, you know, which is this gigantic, vast, insane uh, glider, um, uh, uh, you know, um, made by General Aircraft Limited. Like, it's just the most amazing bit of kit that could carry a little tiny tank or, you know, two universal carriers or the 17 pounder. And. Rather than, you know, there's one of the, one of the 17 pounders that goes to Arnhem is only fired twice in nine days. Right. So you'd have been much better off filling that Hamel car with tons of supplies than mm. sending a great big gun that can't be manhandled easily and can't be used. So everything, absolutely everything is, a, is an opportunity cost. You know, whatever you, whatever you, de- whatever you decide to put in the glider rules out the other things that could go in the glider. And, and, no, so you can see why, and also you can um, you can see why you might end up with berets because you're thinking we might we might need them, you know. And the men, the men of the, the martial culture in airborne forces is that wearing those red berets makes them very proud. They've all told themselves the air, enemy's terrified of men in red berets, and it's got a mm-hmm. profound moral effect. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it's what they think, and it's, so it's like a thing that's tangled up in their own their own cultures as airborne troops, but. But yeah, I mean, the berets sort of, I, when I started writing the book, I was, I was quite determined to find that the berets had never happened. I was going to, you know, we've got to go look at the records and find that there were no berets, you know, and that it's a story that's a, it's a story that's like a folk tale that symbolizes the, the futility of the operation. But there are enough people who saw them and, and they fit within the clothing remit of the resupply. And, and they did send pips and crowns as well for back rank badges and all that sort of stuff. We know that. So it, so it's, it's not symbolic. It's real. And, and, and it just seems like, like, as you say, something else, surely anything, something, anything else, <laughs> bandages, helmets. Why not? You know, like if you're going to send head, yeah. headgear anyway. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, the 388 tons and something like, you, you know, they, 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 they collect 30 or something at the end of the, at the end of the drop that's misdropped and gone the wrong way or shoots have blown the wrong way so so it's a that is an absolute all square disaster that that lift for 38 group for the men on the ground and then you know when allied soldiers are captured later the germans are giving them chocolate british chocolate from those supply Mm. drops which is like really rubbing their noses in it so ken is it fair to say that with the failure of that drop with the resupply not getting them the battle's effectively over. Yes, I think it is. I, I do. I do think it is. The, I mean, the battle's effectively over by by the time the drop happens, though. I think because because okay. the fourth fourth parachute brigades attempt to get into the town along the northern axis in the in the it, north of the railway line in the woods, as I call it in the book, um, has has petered out by then, and they're they're like they're in they they've engaged all their reverse gears they possibly can in getting the hell out of there, and. That's part of the sort of the the, the grand, uh, uh, the dark irony of it is that attack ends, they're withdrawing. So the Germans have been using their flat guns in a ground roll, flat mm-hmm. cannons in a ground roll. And at the moment that 10 power in particular and, and 156 are retreating, that's when the lift comes in and the Germans aren't having to engage the men on the ground with their flat guns. And so are able to engage the the, um, the, the aircraft from 38 group. And, and that's sort of, the rotten luck, rotten timing of, of of that afternoon, because the Germans would have not known. You, you can argue that they'd have thought, well, what do, what do we do? Do we do we keep these ground troops away? Do we shoot these lovely juicy Dakotas down, Sterling's down? But as it is, the, the fourth parachute brigade are on their way out, 
um, of of that area around Johanna Hefe, and the, and the and the Germans are able to then engage the aircraft. So it's like a, it's like literally everything that could go wrong uh, does go wrong at three o'clock. You know, this mad eight minutes, it's horrendous. Yeah, I'm I'm looking at flak at the moment. Flak theory can be repurposed and retasked very quickly. So yeah, 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 and it's incredible. Choosing to shoot it and everything. Yeah, incredibly effective. You know, those 20 millimeter cannon that the, that the Germans had, that they had flak panzer mounted or mounted on half tracks, incredibly effective ground weapon, you know. Um, and the, the, as first airborne, don't bring the firepower with them that, that a conventional um, infantry division would have. They don't have an, they don't have an art answer, artillery answer to any of that, any of that at all. And so the, you know, whole companies are torn to pieces basically by, flak that's been diverted into a ground roll and a weird very geeky thing if you ever watch a documentary about that and you see david lord getting shot down usually it's not market garden footage it's plunder varsity and it's usually commandos curtis commandos going down in flames that they yeah yeah yeah, so look carefully dear viewer for yes please please look carefully and 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 i mean i always think the thing to remember with all of that footage is if it's got any sound on it that's been dubbed it's fake it's nonsense yeah. because they, they you know so think think twice to what you think your ears are giving you with the image as well i mean but yes the the, the army film and photographic unit the, the, the lads who went to on and took um 12 minutes of film with them because they thought they would be there a couple of days they took 12 yeah. minutes of film with them and they did they didn't film that Stanley Max did with the BBC, however, does a live commentary of that supply lift coming in, which is on Spotify, which I recommend everyone listen to. If you want to hear someone um, actually in the moment uh, as it unravel, uh, as it as that unfolds and the sound of the flat fire is absolutely terrifying. Mm. And in his you can hear in his voice, basically. He's because it's a broad. He's be, it's going to be broadcast. He's he's self censoring, so he's not saying it's a disaster, but he's going. They're flying on straight and level. I can see them now, and you can hear him thinking, "Oh my God, this is a slaughter. This is a disaster. Jesus Christ!" And trying to keep it together as he watches watches this. And the sound of the flak is genuinely, genuinely terrifying. Twenty, 20 millimeter flak, the, the, the light medium. It's got that weird whistly howl oh, yeah. it, it's yeah. night nightmare sort of stuff. we'll stick yeah. a link in the description to this so people yes, can go so off it, and it's, get, it's well worth a listen it's not long it's not long because it was only an eight minute drop anyway so uh, the, the, they're only over over the drop zone for eight minutes but it's really really very rare to actually because because after all it's all going wrong and and it's very very rare to get a moment of broadcast for the second world war where someone like tries, you know, he can't gloss this. He can't gloss it. Mm. Whatever he does, he can't. He can't turn it into something palatable for his listener. So the book is escapes into the wild. Now we're sort of recording this the yeah. day after yeah. publication. How how are you feeling about it? Is, is it more than ninety <laughs> percent successful as your old gag goes? What what do you what do you uh-huh. how are you feeling? Well, I'm glad I'm, it's I'm, done. Well, I'm glad it's done. But I I did lie awake uh, most nights in the summer thinking I I you know um, I've bitten off more than I could chew. Has, is it literally a bridge too far and all that? Has my reach exceeds my grasp? <laughs> um, and and more have I, because I, you know, as as, as 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 is obvious, I've decided to approach the thing completely differently to anyone else. Mm. Um, and that's, you know, that, but that's fine. But has that worked? Have I pulled it off? And basically I spent most of my summer holidays when I was away, lying awake at night thinking I haven't pulled it off. That bit's the wrong way round. And and also there are people who know this battle um, far, far, far better than me. And as usual, it's that thing. The more I looked into it, the, the less I realized I knew, you know, that you the minute you start to investigate, it, you think, God, oh, I don't know anything about any of this at all. I don't, you know, I, 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 anyway. And so I don't know. I, I had a very nice review a couple of weeks ago in The Times, which sort of where the, the, the reviewer got it and liked it. And, and in a way, that's like my other job being a comedian you know Mm. people can get a joke but they can still not like it (laughs) (laughs) you know what i mean yeah anyway i like i like i emailed you i I said you you've got a winner here so i think it's going to do it's going to do very it's going to do very well i'm my my thing is i i just wanted you to stay just in 24 hours no backstory just dive in yeah that's i'm in this weird headspace at the moment where there's lots of books that go around the subject for a long time and come in you don't do that but it was 
Yeah, I, that's why I said. You I know I had to, but I kind of I, I did. And there's another bit where because after all, you 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 set yourself a rule like this for a book, and then you and then you think, well, I'll break it for this bit. So the bit about medicine, I do very mm. much break that break that rule and go to go to afterwards because the because the the thing that Alex Lippman Kessel experiences when he's debriefed by his opposite number in um nine s's panzer is absolutely amazing and that the yeah. encounter he has with with what german medicine is the state of german medicine which which tells you why the germans are like they are and why they're fighting like they are um because one of the things that's notable about the battle of arnhem is it is our it's you know on on paper our best soldiers against some of their very worst you know they're just germans are just pumping any old tom dick and heinrich into the battle space in order to in order to hold up the airborne landing and you know it's police battalions it's nco trainees it's kids it's um Luftwaffe, um clerks it's absolutely anyone that they can give give a rifle or a machine gun to and uh, 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 and that so that medicine thing really goes that really gives you a glimpse into the germans attitude to the lives of their own men let alone the enemy, you know. So, mm. so I do, I do, I do stray from my own rules, but they're my rules. I can break them if I want. <laughs> it's, it's, it's your, it's it's your game. Book. You can take your ball wherever you want. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. I mean, I know what you mean, but I, but about going back a bit. But I, I kind of think certainly for some of the people, you really do need to know their experience and their and their and their sort of character references for a lot of them. You need to know. You need to know who Roy Urka is and what he's been through and and all that sort of stuff and how brave a lot of these men are, even even if they're making. Really, I mean, this is the thing. A lot of these guys are—they're far, far braver than I. But they're making some mad, rotten decisions. And you sort of think <laughs> maybe if you were a little, a little less uh, brave and a little more thoughtful, we wouldn't be where we are. But there we are. <laughs> so, what else have you got going? Because you're busy. Like you said, you've just been out yeah. to to Holland with with James for walking, yeah. um, walking well, the ground. For walking the ground, yeah. And then for the commemorations, we're going back out again because there's this thirty core thing where there's like three hundred armored vehicles in a column driving up through Holland, poor, poor old Holland. And, um, yeah. uh, uh, you know, the sort of an orgy of olive drab. And so we're going to that. And then we got people to see at the commemorations as well and stuff to do at the commemorations. And then I'm, I've got another book to come, um, which at the moment I think is going to be about operation ironclad and Madagascar. Oh, um, right. um, because, um, it's the last time the British fight the French. What's not to like, yeah. right? Um, re, uh, 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 French, French contract law thrown in there as well. Yes, and and it's all about. So it's about the minute in Madagascar. So the idea is to use one minute to to tell the story of a truly global war. At the moment where uh, the, you know that that the, there's this moment of crisis. If the Japanese get a substation on um, on Madagascar, then then the Cape's closed. That's the end of operations in the Pacific, unless you go all the way around the other way. Or and also that the, the whole Pacific theatre becomes an American sphere of influence rather than one we have any say in. And you can't ship stuff round the Cape to North Africa. You know, you're you're really, really jiggered if the if the Japanese pull that off. And so there's the attempt to stop that. And you know, it involves the South African Air Force, which is kind of like in in sort of gladiators and stuff, as far as I remember. So mm. it's it's and it, arguably it's the last imperial. It's the sort of it's the Seven Years' War, last gasp of the Seven Years' War. You know, us and the French duking it out in some place that belongs to neither of us. It's kind of like it's kind of uh, <laughs> <laughs> old school vibes. And I think people think of the Second World War not in that not in that context, not in that imperial context. Sometimes so it'd be quite fun to try and write that and play with it. But I'll do the same kind of digressionary thing because it's the first time the navy lose use a landing ship tank i think that they've just they've just got their hands oh, on right. they yeah you and they use it as a proof of concept thing with um with landing tanks on the beach there which is quite interesting so yeah. there's you know there's all those sort of things and there's a spy who swims out to a boat and every night and de -de 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 -de, you know <laughs> sends his morse code and then swims back and lives a double life so there's little sorts of stuff in it and it's not got paratroopers in it because i am what can I tell you? Done with the done with that stuff. This Al stuff. Murray, the airborne guy, done with airborne. I'm yeah, shocked. no, completely. No, absolutely. I mean, I if I have to think about another parachute battalion ever again, dear God. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much My for pleasure. spending a little bit of your Friday afternoon with me, Al. Yeah, well, oh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me. I cannot thank Al Murray enough for joining us here on the Damcasters. Like we said. 
Arnhem Black Tuesday is out now. This is the, the proof that they sent me. I think he's got a hit on his hands with it. And he does break his own rules and go outside of his 24 hours, but it's his book. Like we said, he can do what he wants with it. So check out the links in the description below to the book. Al's on tour as a pub landlord as well at the moment. He's a busy, busy guy. And of course, you know, we have ways. They don't need any more plugging, but yeah, they're there. And they'll stick a link down to the description so you can check out what they're doing, especially as they're heading out and the new um, walking the ground that he's doing with James Holland too. We've got lots of great things coming up on the show, but if you want to hear about it first, you can become a damn castier from just three pounds a month, plus a bit of that over on our Patreon. So you get these episodes ad free early, basically as soon as I edit them up, you get them. Little introduction for me talking about some of the stuff that we have coming up, new books that I've been posted in, get a little overview of those too. And our Zoom social, which is coming up at the end of the month, which he says, looking at the date, <laughs> it's kind of there. All that's coming. Join us. It is a giggle. And we'd be loved having you. And it helps keep the lights on here at the Damcasters. So until next time, thank you so much for your continued support. Thank you to Al for spending an hour or so of his Friday afternoon with me. Thank you to Pima Aaron Space. And most of all, thank you so much for joining us. Do take care of yourselves. And until next time, bye bye. I just want to say many thanks to our fabulous Damcasters on Patreon. If you head over to our Patreon page, you can join the crew and get your name in the credits from just £3 a month plus a bit of that. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bowen and is a Boney Abroad podcast production.